Joe, before I get to the show, I want to ask you about if the, there was some kind of plan in place, given what happened in France at the soccer stadium, uh, you know, heightened security. What was Fox? Did you have a uh, did you have a plan if anything happened yesterday? No, uh, I think that's a good question. Hi, by the way. Hi, buddy. How are you? Good. Hi. Good. It's good to talk to you. Um, I think that's something that we have to talk about as a network, and I'm, I'm sure you guys will, and uh, right on down the line. I, I think there has to be some sort of a contingency plan. I'm sure there is back in the studio, you know, when we're out in the field. I'm, I'm sure something would switch over, and they'd be coming at you from the studio and covering it from a distance. Uh, but, yeah, I, I think it's a valid question and something that should be talked about because uh, when you're in – it just takes me back to to nine eleven and yeah. what it felt like going down to the ballpark after the tragic day that that America suffered and feeling vulnerable going down. I was doing the game for Cardinals TV and my dad was doing the game for Cardinals Radio and I remember driving down there, seeing him and uh, and talking to him about it. You felt like, man, what's next? When's the next hit coming? And being in a big arena like that with 40,000 people certainly seemed like uh, something that would be a target. And, and that was that was what led then to my dad giving that, that poem and the reading on the field. And it was like you needed something to say that it was okay to be there. But, you know, I think we're getting back into that territory, and it is worthwhile talking about a plan because as a network, uh, that's not something we went through. Yeah, I saw a couple of uh, the different stadiums that had security, had dogs out there just sniffing around and, I, I don't know. I guess the first thing I thought of was the same thing you did is 9-11 and how we sort of relax sometimes and how vulnerable we are when we have a stadium full of people. Yeah, I mean, it's just our way of life, you know, and, and then you get the awful wake-up call like we had, like they had in Paris the other day, and then it's like, oh, well, we have to be diligent. Well, obviously, anything could happen at any time in this sick world and uh yeah yeah i think that this is something that has to be stayed uh on top of you know i, I don't know i don't who knows what's going on in airports across yeah. the country and if we're really safe getting on a commercial flight but uh you know obviously you can't bring toothpaste they got that figured out <laughs> but you what it, whatever it is whatever the new regulations have to be i think you have to stick with it especially when you have that many people it wouldn't take much to to scare people and and create what from what i read they were hoping to create uh in paris which was some sort of a mad yep. rush out of a stadium and and all hell breaking loose he's joe buck fox sports his new show undeniable on direct tv's audience network that's wednesday night called the packers and the lions yesterday with troy aikman at what point did you sort of look at each other and go, what the heck is happening here at Lambeau? Yeah, it, it, we did. We literally did. Uh, I would say about midway through the second quarter because, you know, you, you go into those games and you just go play by play. And you, the way they started, man, they were spreading them out. Rodgers was hot. He was targeting Devontae Adams, uh, who was working on a young corner. And it was just bang, 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 bang. They were going down the field. It was like, okay, they're back. And then they stall. They get a field goal. Second time they have it. Second or third time, Cobb drops one that Rodgers laid in his lap where he had the sideline to himself. Would have been a long touchdown or close to it. And looking back, it was like, man, did, did that change the entire game? Because you've got a 1-7 and seven team on the other sideline. If, if Rodgers looks like Rodgers and he hits Cobb down the sideline and, and it's 10 nothing. You know, who knows what the Lions do, but they let the Lions hang in there. And to their credit, they didn't quit despite the front office changes, the coaching changes. They kept coming, and I, I think Caldwell and, and uh, Matthew Stafford deserve credit for that. Terrell Austin, the defensive coordinator, is, is a really smart guy and gets those guys playing. But there was a time where it was like, this just doesn't look like Green Bay. We've done so many great games of theirs, and, and he and I are both such fans of Aaron Rodgers and what they can do. And they're just off. It'd be easy to say, well, it's the line or it's Rodgers. I thought Rodgers looked different yesterday and was off more than we've ever seen him or at least have seen him in a long time. And it just fits and starts. And it just is it's, it's a half step off. And it just doesn't look good right now. 
I week to week, I, I I seem to lose even more knowledge when it comes to what is a catch in the NFL. Now you're the play-by-play guy, the lead guy for Fox, and when you know, I, I don't know if they have seminars on this. You have a rules official and Mike we do. Pereira. Yes, we do. But we but do. It, do you know what a catch is? No, here's the beauty of what I get to do. Uh, they have ruled out a catch. They're going to go under the hood, and uh, let's send it to Mike Pereira. Mike, that's all I got. Because you're right, it seems it's it's a moving target, and and it seems to change week to week. I I don't know, you know, and I, I do I did understand the one last night, and it is on a tape. We get a tape that's sent to us, a little video that's sent to us every week, and I do bother to watch them because I I don't want to be embarrassed on national TV not knowing a basic that I should know. But then it gets into interpretation. And we had it last year in Lambeau with the Des Bryant non-catch, with him reaching for the goal line. Mike Pereira thought that was a good call. And and I read on his Twitter feed last night he thought the overturn of the touchdown or the no-catch result was the right call. And, And I really defer to him. But making a catch, getting two feet down, becoming a runner, uh, I kind of get that, and that's what the call was and what Beckham wasn't last night. Chris Collinsworth said last night, and it's one of those where you're thinking it, I, you know, probably, and then he just said it out loud. He goes, I don't know what a catch is anymore, and I do this for a living. Right. Well, I, I completely get it. And there are times where by the eye test, that's, that's the one with the Des Bryant. I, I didn't see a thousand replays of the one last night. I was in transit. I saw it once. Um, and then I read the, the Twitter feed and was looking at it a little bit. But, boy, did I see enough of the one last year with Des Bryant at Green Bay. And that's the one that, by your eye, you know you know what, what a catch looks like. And you know what the, the act of, of catching a football is. You have complete control of that ball. And if not for the goal line, which is what he was reaching for, yep. he completely secures that ball going to the ground. But because he did the reach at the very end of that "Quote unquote process." The mm. ball popped out. It's no catch, and and it it's got to frustrate fans to no end. They don't get those tapes, and and it becomes harder and harder to explain what the heck these guys are trying to accomplish uh, with the rule book. Yeah, I know. I just think that these guys get punished sometimes for being great athletes. Des Bryant, yeah, made- that that's that is well said. I agree with that. And and Des Bryant sniffing out the goal line last year. Yeah. And that's ancient history by now, but but I, I think that was the case. All right, the new show, and I saw the guest list, and uh, I mean that's that's Murderer's Row. You did a great job. Uh, the the toughest interview of everybody that you've sat down with, not the best interview, as much as the most challenging. Yeah, well, I, at least on this list is the one that we're starting with. Um, I, I we're starting with Derek Jeter because. Uh, He's the biggest name, I think, on the list, and he's in a position that people haven't seen him in. But he just mastered the art of standing in front of a microphone as a Yankee player and being kind of the center and the calm for that team and really not saying anything. And so as that interview goes on, I think you see Jeter more and more comfortable Uh, And to the point where he brings up the rumors about what he gives women on their way out of the door with the gift basket rumor and the cell phone rumor in his house and all that. I brought up the cell phones. He brought up the gift baskets. And then you see his shoulders kind of relax. And then he's just talking like a guy to the point where at the end of it, I was asking him these stupid, silly questions, and he was being combative back. And I said, you're just a little bitch. And, (laughs) And he laughed in the audience. I thank God he laughed. Uh, but that that he he's a tough interview because you know he comes in guarded and you have to somehow find your way through the hands that are up covering his face. Otherwise, I got to tell you these these sports personalities and these greats, whether it's Gretzky or or Aikman or man Abby Wambach, Michael Phelps, Michael Phelps. Wait wait till you see that one. And it's not I'm not saying it because of me. I'm saying it because of him. These athletes sat down and they wanted to talk. These were two and a half hour interviews, sometimes three, that they're cutting down to an hour, and it was uh, wow. it was impressive that they were willing to give as much as they gave. I, I think we kind of hit a nerve with what we hope to do with this show. Who cried? Every one of them, including Jeter, teared up. Uh, every one of the thirteen guests we've had cried. Look at there you. you. I'm, I'm the new, I'm the Roy Firestone of DirecTV. <laughs> I, 
<laughs> I'm going to start doing imitations and banquets now. <laughs> who was Waterworks? Who who cried, and then you couldn't get him to stop crying? Well, Michael Phelps, but he he was crying because. He was revealing stuff about the DUIs and about what it was like when he went into the rehab center and being sh- shaking so much he couldn't walk. And then walking through the cafeteria inside the, the center, walking past everybody, sitting down, slumped shoulders, crying, looking up, and all he saw was the American flag. And I thought, man, how many times has he had that draped over him or mm-hmm. been in this great triumphant moment for the country with a gold medal and he was reduced to that they took everything from him and then talking about what the second dui meant to him now he now he's talking about it in print where he said he didn't want to live and and i pressed him on that and and he was close to ending his own life and you know that that was this wasn't like i'm crying because i'm thinking of my pet turtle in high school this was real life and death and and how down he was and how much he's changed i've known him on both sides of that fence and i'm telling you he's like a different person and i'm not so sure we we've seen the best michael phelps in the pool we might we we might see that the next go around more interested in interviewing ronda rousey now after the loss yeah i think he would have to be you know because everything was so rosy and everything was perfect and she was just winding them up and knocking them down, and, and now she's suffered a loss. I think that's what you always want. You want somebody who's tasted success. And all these people, I don't care who it is, Gretzky, I mean, Gretzky talking about what it was like as a six-year-old playing with 12-year-olds and how he was, you know, other parents were, you know, looking sideways at his parents. I mean, I don't know, how one year he had 270 goals in a in a – uh, in a hockey league, and you know, other parents are like, "Hey, uh, my kid's open too, Wayne. How about a pass?" <laughs> and and you know, he was so good and so different and so gifted and worked so hard that uh, that he was not only celebrated, but from other kids, you know, there there was a lot of jealousy, and other parents there was a lot of jealousy. So doesn't matter who you are, everybody's been through something, and I think that's what you learn coming out of this series. I did, and and I think the audience learned that as well. Good luck on that. Safe travels. Tell Troy we said hello. Thank you, Joe. I will, buddy. All right. See you, Dan.